مساء الخير مشاهدينا واهلا وسهلا بكم الى هذا اللقاء الخاص مع وزير الخارجيه الامريكي انتوني بلينكن من المملكه العربيه السعوديه. مستر سكرتري ثانكس فور سيتنج داون. It's good to be with you. Mr. Secretary, since we are in Saudi Arabia, I have to start by asking about the relationship with Saudi Arabia. We saw this drama in October over OPEC plus mm -hmm. decision, and you said at that time that you would review the relationship. Also, you said that at the beginning of the first term of the administration, mm -hmm. you kept saying as well that this relationship is strategic. Mm -hmm. But does a strategic relationship or partnership require periodic reviews? And if I may mm -hmm. ask, mm -hmm. is it a strategic relationship or transactional? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a strategic relationship, and um, it's no secret we had a difference uh, of views in October over the uh, OPEC Plus decision. But I think what um, we're seeing is uh, an increasing convergence in our partnership to advance issues of mutual interest to Saudi Arabia, to the United States, and for that matter, to countries in the region and, and beyond. Look, we've, we've had a partnership together for decades that was grounded in security, uh, cooperation, uh, energy, uh, and in recent years, counterterrorism. And that foundation remains. But what we're also seeing, and what this visit um, reconfirms, is that there are important opportunities uh, for our two countries uh, to work together to advance some very positive uh, issues, very positive trends. Uh, De-escalation of tensions in the region. That's important, and we're working together on that. Greater integration of the region. There are real opportunities that, uh, that we're working on together. Collaboration between our countries in addressing some of the challenges that not only uh, are of concern to our people, but to people around the world, from health security, to climate security, uh, to energy security, to food security. And of course, the transition to, uh, to clean energy, um, working on emerging technologies. So uh, there's a, a long-standing foundation, but there are also increasingly areas where um, we have convergence and uh, we're working together to advance the mutual interests of, uh, of our people. So in that sense, it's very, it, it is strategic, and I think that's important. Second, um, I think if you look at uh, the work that we've been doing together, just to cite two examples, Yemen ending a horrific war, Saudi Arabia is playing a critical and very positive role in trying to bring that war to an end. And then just in recent weeks, the partnership we've had in Sudan in trying to end the violence that's emerged there. So I see this as um, being on a positive trajectory based on the, the interests that, uh, that we share. And as I said, it's, it's, it's uh, happening in a, almost a broader terrain um, than just as important as they are uh, the military, uh, energy, and counterterrorism cooperation that we've had for decades. Mr. Secretary, you made it here on Tuesday, the same day the Iranians opened mm -hmm. their, uh, reopened their embassy here mm -hmm. in Riyadh, and it was the outcome of a deal brokered by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. I know um, people are realistic about the deal and the expectations, mm -hmm. but we didn't use to see this move by the Chinese. Does it concern you to see in this region this assertive diplomacy by the Chinese? We, uh, we applaud uh, what happened. Anything that um, de-escalates tensions, that takes at least one problem uh, off of the agenda, uh, and in this case also may have the, uh, the additional benefit of helping to advance uh, peace in, um, in Yemen, uh, we think is a good thing. Even if the Chinese have has a role in Yemen, you don't mind if, that. Uh, if if countries, whoever they are, can play a positive role in helping to advance uh, peace, de-escalate tensions, uh, again, we think that's a good thing. Uh, and of course, the Saudis and Iranians have been talking together for um, for at least a couple of years uh, to get uh, to get to this place. We'll see what uh, what happens now. But again, if it reduces tensions, if it uh, at least takes one problem off of the board. That's very positive. Mr. Secretary, I'm asking here mm -hmm. about the Chinese mm -hmm. uh, role mm -hmm. in the region. It's growing. We're noticing that. Mm -hmm. Everybody is mm -hmm. seeing that. Does it concern the U.S.? If uh, countries can play, uh, including China,
can play a positive role uh, wherever it is in helping to uh, advance peace, to reduce uh, tensions, then again, I think that's positive. That's what we should all be trying to do. Um, and more broadly, uh, any actions that major powers, including China, take that are, are positive, that uh, advance uh, peace, reconciliation, that's good. Are you trying to revive the negotiations over the GCPOA? So we, from day one, sought to uh, determine whether a return to mutual compliance with the JCPOA was possible, and we made, we made a significant effort in that, in, in that direction, uh, as did uh, the European partners, and for that matter, uh, Russia and China. Uh, but Iran either couldn't or wouldn't do what was necessary to get back into compliance with the uh, JCPOA. So um, the JCPOA is not our focus. Uh, we continue to believe that diplomacy is the best way, more generally, to sustainably, ver verifiably, and effectively ensure that Iran doesn't uh, acquire a nuclear weapon. So we remain open uh, to uh, diplomacy, and that is clearly the, the best path. At the same time, we're also very determined to stand against the actions that Iran takes that are dangerous, uh, destabilizing, and that was very much the uh, part of the conversation that we had yesterday with our colleagues in the Gulf Cooperation Council. You said many times, and the president as well said, that you will do what it takes to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. The Israeli are kindly promoting a military option. Is this option on the table? President Biden has been very clear repeatedly, uh, consistently, that, again, all options are on the table to ensure that Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon. Are you trying to get uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia closer for this purpose, for preventing Iran from having a nuclear weapon? So what we've seen in the, uh, in the region is greater integration. And we've seen that in part through uh, the process of normalization between Israel and uh, its, its neighbors, uh, between uh, Arab countries, uh, Muslim-majority countries uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the region. And that's a very positive trend. And it's something that we've been determined to, uh, to help uh, work on, both to uh, deepen some of the existing agreements uh, and also to, to broaden the, uh, uh, the effort. So if uh, there are things we can do to uh, support the further normalization, the further integration of the region, uh, we will. Mr. Secretary, you spoke about Sudan, and the, and the negotiations mm. are now suspended. You imposed sanctions, but what's next? What tools are you going to use to bring the parties uh, again to the table? Mm. And how do you respond to the critics that say the conflict could have been avoided had you decided to engage earlier? Well, uh, second part first, we've been, in, we've been engaged from day one on Sudan. And in fact, uh, until the generals decided to go to war with each other, mm -hmm. uh, we were on a, on a positive track in advancing a transition to a civilian-led government. That had made significant progress, including as a result of our very engaged diplomacy. Uh, but tragically, the, uh, the two generals in question decided to um, go at each other and inflict uh, terrible violence on the entire country. And even then, we immediately engaged uh, to try to stop uh, the, uh, the, the violence, uh, to try to... Um, get ceasefires, uh, to get humanitarian assistance flowing, and to get Sudan back on the track that it had been on, toward a transition to a civilian-led uh, government. We had working, by the way, in very close partnership with Saudi Arabia. We had some success in getting very limited uh, ceasefires that were highly imperfect, but did allow more humanitarian assistance to get in and reach about 2 million people that otherwise would not have uh, had this uh, assistance provided to them. But we've also reached a point where increasingly uh, both sides uh, are not respecting the commitments they make in terms of the ceasefire. So uh, we're really looking to see in the days ahead whether they are serious uh, about this process, uh, serious about adhering to the ceasefires that they commit to, and serious uh, about then hopefully broadening that to get back to um, looking at a broader cessation of hostilities and, a, um, and the transition process. Um, if not, we will have to look at other options for dealing with the, uh, dealing with the situation. Are sanctions an option? Um, 
again, uh, we'll, 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 we have various tools at our disposal. I think we've made that clear uh, in recent days. I'm not going to um, uh, get ahead of ourselves. First, we want to see uh, if they're genuinely serious about a ceasefire process. And if they're not, we have tools at our disposal to um, move to try to move this in another way. Mr. Secretary, you said, and uh, everybody in this administration is saying that you will support Ukraine as long as it takes. Mm. But it's an open-ended commitment. Mm. I mean, can you elaborate a little bit about the outcome acceptable to you and Ukraine mm. as well? Well, first, I think it's important to note that the outcome that Vladimir Putin sought uh, is already for him unachievable. Uh, he's already failed in what he was trying to accomplish, which is to erase Ukraine from the map, to eliminate its independence, to um, absorb it into Russia. That has failed. It can't succeed. Where exactly this settles and under what conditions and when, that does remain to be determined. And I think what we've heard, not just from us, not just from the more than 50 countries that are actively supporting Ukraine and helping it to defend itself, but from more than 140 countries at the United Nations, uh, multiple occasions in resolutions of the security of the uh, General Assembly, uh, are a commitment that countries want to see peace, but they want to see a peace that is consistent with the principles of the United Nations Charter, notably territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty. So this is not just us. This is countries around the world saying, yes, we want peace. We want to see this aggression end. We want to see it settle uh, in, a good, in, a, in a good place. And that means uh, a, a just and durable peace. And a just peace means it has to be consistent with the principles of the United Nations Charter. A durable peace means one in which uh, we don't simply press the pause button, allow Russia to uh, rearm and rest, and then reattack and repeat this exercise in six months or a year. Mr. Secretary, I have to ask two quick questions. Mm. I know we're running out of time. Uh, on Syria, mm. I watched your interview in two, uh, 2020 when you said you weren't able to prevent mm. a big loss of life there and you will take this with you for the rest of your life. Mm. What's your policy on Syria? Um, what has happened, what uh, Assad has inflicted on his own country and on his own people uh, is a tragedy. And uh, as someone who was in a previous administration, in the Obama administration at the time that uh, this happened, yes, I very much regret that we couldn't do more or do more effectively uh, to stop the killing, uh, to stop the, uh, the slaughter of Syrian people, to stop the abuses being committed against them. And so that is something that uh, I feel very, very strongly. Um, our policy remains to see the actual application of the relevant UN Security Council Resolution 2254 uh, so that there's a genuine uh, political transition in, uh, in Syria that reflects the rights and aspirations of the Syrian people. But short of that, and until then, there are a number of things that are absolutely critical uh, that would actually improve the lives of, of Syrians. One is greater access to humanitarian assistance. Uh, we go through this exercise every few months of renewing the uh, United Nations mandate for that. Um, we need to see that renewed for a much longer period of time, and we need to see gr uh, a greater number of crossings allowed so humanitarian assistance can flow into, into Syria to all communities uh, on, on, on all sides, particularly in the wake of the earthquake. We need to have, see an environment in which it would be possible for people to return uh, to Syria, but under uh, the right conditions where they're, where they're safe uh, and protected. Uh, we need to see um, access to uh, the prisons, the detention centers. We need accountability for what's happened to tens of thousands of uh, people, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and, uh, of course, we also need to see Syria uh, take responsible action to end the um, trade in, in Captagon, which is devastating communities uh, throughout the region. Synthetic opioids are having a horrific effect here in the, in the Middle East, and in this case, Captagon originating in, in Syria. Also, by the way, in the United States, where a different synthetic opioid, fentanyl, uh, is doing tremendous damage uh, to the United States. It's one of the reasons we'll be bringing countries together uh, in an effort to form a coalition to deal with synthetic opioids. But in this case, this is something that Syria and, and Assad needs to take action on. One final question. Mr. Secretary, I am from this region. Mm. In 1991, the U.S. convened the Madrid mm -hmm. Peace Conference mm. between the Israeli and the Palestinians. A week, Mikhail Gorbachev was on the table. Mm. And the U.S. was the sole superpower in the Middle East mm. and beyond. Mm. 
more than three decades. The Chinese are here, the Russians are here. Are you leaving this, this region? What happened to the superpower in the Middle East? Well, I think modestly, I would say that my presence here over the last three days is one uh, element to demonstrate that no, uh, we're certainly not leaving. We're here to stay. President Biden, of course, uh, was here last year uh, and not and brought uh, together the GCC and uh, and many other countries. Day in day out, we're working with partners uh, throughout the region, and what I hear in almost all of my engagements, is the United States remains the number one partner of choice. That is clear in what I hear, what we hear from all of our partners. And we're engaging uh, with them, working with them, uh, both to, to deal with many of the challenges that you just talked about, which are real and urgent and acute, but also, and this is so important, on an affirmative agenda for the future, not just dealing with the crises, but actually trying together to build a better future for our people in the United States and for people throughout this region. And you see that in the collaboration that I noted earlier that we have that's growing stronger and stronger in dealing with issues like food insecurity, uh, like the transition to clean energy, uh, like how to deal um, and, and make sure that uh, emerging technologies uh, are used uh, for the good, uh, like addressing climate change. COP28 uh, will be here uh, in the region in the, uh, in the Emirates in just a few months. Um, making sure that we have investments in infrastructure, for example, that are a race to the top, that protect the rights of workers, the environment, uh, and, um, and really address the needs of, of local communities. These are the kinds of things that we're working on together. Uh, and that's incredibly positive and incredibly affirmative for the future. So yes, we're dealing with crises, we're dealing with security challenges, but we're also dealing with an affirmative agenda. And across the board, on all of that, as I said, what I hear again and again is the United States is our preferred partner. Uh, we are a partner and we're here. Mr. Secretary, 10 minutes and 15 minutes are not enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sitting down with us. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.